to begin um, with a perplexing question I have, which is, why do conservatives hate the ACA? It got 22 million people covered. Healthcare inflation has been its lowest level uh, in, you know, certainly since the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, businesses have benefited by low increase in their health insurance costs. There's been a boom in venture capital investing. What's so bad about the damn thing? You've given kind of the, um, you know, the, the version of the, the AC that you would give on uh, MSNBC or Fox News. And I mean, I think there are a lot of people who would argue that uh, there are a lot of problems with the AC. In fact, a lot of your colleagues, many of whom who have advised both Hillary Clinton and President Obama would also say that there are problems with the ACA. So I don't think the, the fact that there are problems with the ACA or that it hasn't lived up to expectations, particularly when it comes to premiums in the individual market, I don't think that's controversial anymore. It was controversial maybe four years ago when a lot of people were relying on the expertise of uh, left of center health economists to assure us all that premiums were for sure going to go down in the non-group market as a result of these reforms. Obviously that hasn't been the case. And, uh, People like myself were, were uh, raising that alarm, as people in this room know, as we've been having these arguments with some members of your faculty for several years about this. You know, under uh, uh, the last Republican president, uh, premiums went up in his eight years, 80% for families in the employer-sponsored market. Uh, under uh, President Obama, they went up under 35%. Looks like a big difference to me. Um, and while no one in this room is going to live to see premiums go down. Going up more slowly is better than going up faster. And again, I don't think all of that's the ACA, right? Certainly not all of it the ACA. Some of it's the ACA, and some of it is a result of less uncompensated care, uh, fear in the, in the uh, provider market, um, and moderating costs, and some of it's efficiency and uh, you know, volume uh, reduction in utilization. Again, I just don't understand what's so bad about it. Yeah, you know, listen, I mean, I don't have a PhD in economics like many of the people Neither in this room do, do but, I, but, well, but the one thing my, my economics PhD friends tell me is that correlation isn't causation, and so we should make sure not to assign every trend that has happened in the last eight years to the, the ACA. I'm sure you wouldn't want to be associated with all the bad things that have that. happened. I said at least some um, of it is So, you know, pharmaceutical prices have gone up by probably, you know, 100% over that time frame over the Obama years. I don't think that's necessarily President Obama's fault. Maybe a small portion of it is, but, uh, but not most of it. So, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, employers, how have, how have employers responded to what's been happening in the healthcare system? Obviously, they're, they're very concerned about costs. I, it's not because of ACA regulations that employer-sponsored insurance is moderated in cost. Um, I hope if we preserve the Cadillac tax or something like it, that may play a role someday in the future in moderating costs in the employer-sponsored market. But I think what's happening in the employer-sponsored market is uh, they've reached a breaking point in terms of what those costs are, and they're doing things that they weren't doing before, such as raising deductibles, narrowing networks. And the ACA has catalyzed, I will say, some of that because I think the fact that the ACA has, shall we say, market-tested narrower networks in the non-group market has led employers to, to be more receptive to those models than they were in the past. So I think there is some, some credit we can give the ACA in, in that score. So maybe you can explain this, which I have never fully understood. Um, through lots of pain and suffering, uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, did pass the Cadillac tax mm -hmm. and did put a limit uh, on uh, basically upper income people getting a tax break for buying health insurance and, and the tax exclusion uh, and use some of that resources to subsidize poor people getting insurance. Um, last I looked, lots of Republicans voted to postpone it uh, um, while simultaneously wanting more uh, uh, limits on the, uh, on the uh, uh, tax exclusion. Seems like a contradiction to me, but I'm a simple doctor from Philadelphia who doesn't practice anymore because I can't make heads or tails of things. I can assure you that I have uh, made the argument uh, both in public and in private that um, the Cadillac tax is, something like the Cadillac tax should be an important feature of of GOP efforts at health reform for all the reasons. That Maybe you can enlighten that. people as to your uh, uh, change in the uh, tax exclusion in. Uh well, so in the in the first edition, the so transcending Obamacare, the first edition came out in 2014 when I was at a, a think tank in New York called the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, um, and in that version, the the whole premise of transcending Obamacare was 
Republicans are never going to have 60 votes in the Senate. And so any version 2.0 of health reform that was more shaped by Republicans than Democrats would have to be bipartisan. And the idea behind transcending Obamacare was to say, instead of focusing purely on repeal and replace strategies that rely on repealing all of the ACA and then replacing it with something else, which will never happen if you don't have 60 votes in the Senate, let's actually focus on the kind of health care system we want to have. And whether that involves repealing or just evolving in the general direction of that better system, let's, let's identify what that better system is and identify ways to transition to that better system. And so in the, in the first edition of Transcending Obama, the second one is somewhat similar in this regard. Uh, the idea was to say, what would, what would I change? What would we want to change about the current system to get to that endpoint, whether that involved repeal or not? What would be the things you want to change? And the Cadillac text in the original edition, the very first edition we launched, I didn't even change it. I just said, you know, let's not fight that fight because that's not really, that's not the most important thing to change about the healthcare system today. Um, in later editions of, uh, of Transcending Obamacare, we've said you could replace the, uh, the, a, the Cadillac tax and the ACA with a fiscally equivalent standard deduction for the employer tax solution. So right now, as you all know, it's an unlimited tax break with, that is exempt from federal, state, and local income taxes and also payroll taxes, which amounts to $500 billion a year of lost tax revenue to, to, the, to various government entities. Um, the idea here would be to say, and this is something that was proposed by George W. Bush in 2007 in his health reform plan, among others, is to say, let's have a standard deduction where, say, above a certain threshold, like $18,000 for a family, uh, the exclusion would just no longer apply. So you, you would be excluded for the first $18,000, and after that, uh, it would be taxable income. The Cadillac tax is, is not exactly like that, in that the Cadillac tax applies a 40% excise tax to certain people in cer without, with some exemptions and loopholes uh, who, uh, who then have value, uh, the, you know, who have insurance that exceeds a certain threshold. So the Cadillac tax is a little bit clunkier than I think I most, most pointy-headed people we like agree. us would, would prefer, and, and I understand the politics behind why that happened, but so that, so that would be the cleaner approach, and so we've, we've included that in the bill. Would you so income we'll link it so that uh, only the rich uh, have to pay? Um, I mean, what, what about the following proposal, which some of us prefer? No one making over $250,000, including the faculty in this room, could get the tax exclusion. I'm sure that your friends in the labor unions would love that approach because it would, it would exempt them. But I, I, I like that approach. I, I think, I think the, 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 the employer tax solution in general is a highly regressive tax, and we should do everything we can to eliminate it. And, and I think if you just means test the elimination, you just don't, you don't go far enough to reform the health care system because you're not affecting enough you know, enough of the healthcare system. I mean, if the goal, if the point, we all understand the problems with the employer tax solution and how it drives up healthcare costs. If the goal is to reform that and not just be a tax, then the goal should be to reform it more broadly.